Yeah, so uh, welcome to I think the, the second uh, lesson in the revision that we'll be doing towards the writing of the law school entrance examination. Uh, a lot of you have been contacting me behind the scene when we are going to start. Uh, my time has been extremely uh, limited due to obvious uh, commitments that I have uh, towards so many things. Nevertheless, uh, because of the legitimate expectation which I have uh, created that we'll be doing this, I have decided that every uh, every night from probably tonight until the night that we write the exams, I will try and do at least one hour or one and a half hours uh, with whoever will be able to come online. Those who not be able to come online, that is a, that is fine. You can always play back and and see what we can do. Yeah. So uh, this is what we are going to do. Uh, I am picking indications that uh, the there may not be a multiple choice, although it's not yet communicated formally. It is more likely that the multiple choice examination may probably be scrapped. Or if it is not scrapped at all, it may probably seriously be diminished in terms of the contribution that it makes towards uh, the overall performance and also past passing. And for that matter, uh, I'd like to encourage you for us to take seriously the written component of the exams, especially how to solve problem-based question and how to write proper essays. Now, I would like us to start uh, with constitutional law uh, tonight. And for constitutional law, my interest uh, tonight lies in uh, the, the, the topic which has to do with constitutional review. Uh, so I like us to have like a conversation, not a, a very formal, strict uh, delivery of a lecture, but just to tease your minds on issues that I like to direct to to think along. Now you notice that uh, this year marks exactly thirty years when the we we went to referendum in April. Uh, 1992 to endorse our constitution. So our constitution is effectively uh, 30 years, if we are reckoning from the referendum, but if we are reckoning from when it actually entered into force, then the argument to be made that uh, 7th January 2023 will be exactly 30 years. Uh, when uh, the constitution came into force. Now that uh, provides interesting uh, contests in terms of uh, possibly uh, things that we can be quizzed on as far as constitutional law is concerned. Particularly so when we look at some challenges uh, which we've also had as a nation, we also the hang parliament and uh, the issue about uh, quorum in parliament and all the the constitutional uh, politicking preceding the the passage of the e levy and so many other things so it will not be out of place uh, for you to be invited for example to uh, either address a specific aspect of the constitution, which you think uh, is in need of reform, or uh, you could be invited uh, generally to reflect on areas that you think are candidate for reform. I mean, that is 
uh, a legitimate uh, topic uh, for you to uh, think through as uh, you prepare, as far as constitutional law is concerned. And quite apart from that, it is also important for us to remember the Constitutional Review Commission work. Uh, the report is available uh, on the internet. You can look at it. And you notice that the Constitutional Review uh, Commission report and the white paper following it is quite uh, comprehensive on a number of subjects. So uh, I will encourage you now that you have uh, about three months, because you know, you'll know be writing the exams on 20th September. Uh, the official communication, I'm sure, will come early through the law days. Uh, we know that it's 20th September that you'll be doing the exams. So if that is the case, what it means is that uh, you have barely uh, three months to go. And if you are preparing to write uh, constitutional law, for example, and you wanted to uh, do a good preparation, it will not be out of place, as I've indicated to you, uh, because we have entered the third decade in which we endorse the constitution, and certainly uh, next year will also be exactly 30 years when the constitution entered into force. Uh, we inaugurated the first president under the fourth republic and all that. So it is quite proper. It is opposite. It is not out of place for us to be interested in issues pertaining to constitutional reforms and all that. So uh, that is one. Now, in talking about uh, constitutional reform, I think we need to also uh, situate, I mean, situate the, 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 the discussion in the context of the constitution uh, itself. Now, as you remember very well, if you look at the uh, constitution itself, it provides a mechanism for amending the constitution. So if you go to uh, chapter 25 of the constitution, uh, there's a, a mechanism uh, which should be followed if you want to uh, amend the constitution. So regarding what I have told you, uh, that it is useful to be interested in uh, amendments of the, of the constitution as the case may be. Uh, it is also uh, important, uh, a number of things uh, to come into view here. So first, the process itself, right? The process itself. And the process, I would like us to start from, at, uh, from uh, chapter 25, that is article 289 up to uh, article 292. Uh, these are the provisions uh, which give us a, a good sense of uh, what it means to uh, amend the constitution. And uh, at this uh, stage, it is uh, pertinent for us to uh, appreciate the fact that uh, we have entrenched provisions and then uh, unentrenched provisions. So we have to uh, keep that uh, in mind. And we have to know, uh, because if you are, for example, invited to uh, either discuss particular issues, which you would like to see reform of our constitution. Uh, it is important for you to know whether uh, those provisions that you are dealing with are provisions uh, which relate to uh, the particular uh, provisions, I'm going to list rather entrenched or uh, non-entrenched uh, provision. So I think that uh, is something that we have to uh, be interested in. Uh, so are we dealing with uh, uh, 
uh, entrenched or not entrenched because you have to know that if we are dealing with the uh, entrenched provision, the procedure is different. If we are not dealing with the entrenched provision, the pro procedure is also different. So at the outset, I will urge you look at article uh, 290, for example. And article 290 will tell you uh, which of the provisions of the constitution are entrenched. So please look at article 290 and uh, get as many of them, or even all of them, as possible on your fingertips so that in case you are invited to, for example, either you are giving an aspect for you to discuss. For example, if they've uh, brought up the issue of uh, that this is a deputy speaker, uh, not forming part of the quorum, forming part of the quorum, can vote, cannot vote, assuming, assuming in the light of, let's say, the Supreme Court decision, you've been asked to uh, actually share some thoughts as to whether that should be amended or that should not be amended and all that. You need to know whether the provision given is a provision which is entrenched or not entrenched. So as I indicated to you, if you look at Article 290, for example, of the Constitution, uh, the following have been stated as the entrenched provisions. Uh, Article 1, 2, and 3, uh, that is uh, uh, those introductory aspects talking about the supremacy of the constitution and then enforcement. These are entrenched. Then the provisions on territories of Ghana, especially articles four and five, are entrenched. And then the sources of laws of Ghana, Article 11 itself, is also entrenched. Uh, the whole of Chapter 5, fundamental human rights and freedoms, entrenched. Uh, representation of the people, uh, at course 42, 43, right up to that. Yeah, so all that I'm trying to suggest to you is that if you look at Article 90, uh, Clause 1, the framers of the Constitution have actually listed those uh, aspects of the Constitution which are considered uh, entrenched. And as I, 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 I indicated to you, uh, I will prefer that. Uh, my internet went away. I don't know. Uh, I didn't know I had been off. Uh, what was the last sentence you heard me say before it went off so that I know where it continued? Anybody? I didn't know I had been taking off. I just realized it. Uh, what was the last one that I made? Yes, before I went off, uh, what did you hear me say last? Uh, anybody? Uh, Michael? Yes, please. What did you hear me say last before my- Article 91. Oh, uh, two, uh, 291. 291, all right, okay. Okay, all right, thank you. Good, thank you. Yeah, so I was just making the point that uh, I would like to encourage all of you to please uh, look at after 291 and have on your fingertips, as it were, uh, those aspects of the constitution, which are called entrenched. The reason for saying that uh, is that once you know that these are the entrenched, then what it means is that all the rest are not entrenched. And that being the case, if you are invited to either discuss whether it is necessary to reform any particular aspect of the constitution, uh, you must uh, first of all know whether it is entrenched or non-entrenched. Because if it is entrenched, the procedure, as you know, is different. If it's not entrenched, the procedure is also uh, different. So let's keep that in mind. Then <clears throat> in terms of 
the procedure for amending the entrenched one. Uh, as we know, uh, if we look at the clause two, everything is spelled out there. Uh, you cannot uh, amend entrenched uh, uh, pro uh, um, 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 entrench provision without making uh, a referral to the Council of State. So the bill, which is seeking to amend the entrenched provision before uh, Parliament proceeds to consider it, must be referred to the Council of State for its advice. And then the Council of State is given 30 days within which to uh, think through whether it will like to give it blessing in terms of the proposed amendment or it will like to suggest something uh, different. Now, that bill seeking to amend the entrenched uh, provision is also supposed to be published in the gazettes. Uh, and the publication in the gazettes will have to be made uh, six months, will have to be made six months before it is introduced in the parliament. So if we look at uh, Article 290, uh, Clause 3, it says, and I quote, the bill shall be published in the Gazette, but shall not be introduced in the parliament until the expiry of six months after the publication in the Gazette under this clause. So uh, it's taken to a uh, Council of State, and then it is also supposed the Council of State has got the uh, uh, Okay, yeah, so we were discussing the amendment procedure. We're discussing the amendment uh, procedure for entrenched uh, provisions of the constitution before the line uh, went off. Yeah, so we are looking at Article 290. Uh, starting from uh, clauses two, three, four, uh, five, and six. And we made the point that uh, before you can proceed with the amendment of entrenched provision, it is a mandatory requirement that the bill, which is seeking to do the amendment, must be referred to Council of State. And the Council of State has got uh, 30 days within which to make uh, its mind. However, before uh, Parliament will be able to even consider it and all that, there is a bigger requirement. The bigger requirement is that advertise the bill by publication in the Gazette so that all the citizenry who cares to know what is going on will become aware that these are the possible uh, amendments which are going to be made in the constitution. And as I indicated, if you look at the constitution itself, the amendment is supposed to be made uh, I'm oh, sorry, the, the, the publication is supposed to be made six months. It has been a gazette for six months before uh, it is introduced to uh, parliament. So that is very important. And after the six months uh, publication in the gazette, when it has been read in parliament for the first time, uh, no work is to be undertaken by parliament in relation to the bill seeking to amend the entrenched provision unless it has been referred to electorates in Ghana in the form of referendum for those who are eligible to vote to indicate whether they agree with the proposed amendment or they do not agree. And this will be in the form of 
a special election we call a uh, referendum. So that will have to be done. And there are rules governing the referendum in terms of the voter turnout or the participation. The clause four of Article 290 requires that you need at least 40% of persons entitled to vote. That is to say that if you take all yeah, so if you take all those who have uh, been registered as eligible voters in Ghana, the referendum, which is supposed to approve the amendment of the entrenched provision, must be participated in, or you must have 40% of the voters who will take part in the referendum. So if you get less than 40% turnout, what it means is that you have not met the constitutional threshold and the proposed amendment of the referendum can actually uh, proceed because it did not get at least 40% of voters participating in the referendum. Now, out of the 40% who vote at the referendum, 75% of those persons voting must actually vote in favor of the passage of the bill. So if you take the 40% of those who are eligible to vote and 75%, in effect, we are trying to say that about 37% of that 40, uh, of, of that 40% uh, uh, or so uh, should vote yes uh, in support of the passage. That is if I have done the mass well. But the most important thing is that uh, out of the 40% of those who are eligible to vote, who are required to actually take part in the referendum, 75% of those actually voting must say yes or must agree with the proposed uh, amendment before you can uh, go ahead. Uh, so let us uh, look at that. Now, where the bill has been approved at the referendum, uh, parliament shall pass it. And the way they shall pass it, well, at that stage, parliament does not have a choice in the matter. Parliament does not have choice in the matter. It will have to uh, pass it. And once it has been passed, then the president uh, too has the obligation to assent to it. Uh, just as we see in the case of Article 106 uh, on the mode of exercise of legislative power, where the president is supposed to assent to a bill that has only been passed by parliament. The same thing is required of the president in the event that the referendum has endorsed the passage of the bill for amendment of the entrenched, entrenched provision, and parliament has actually proceeded to uh, pass it as it were. So in a nutshell, that is the picture uh, regarding amendment of the entrenched provision. And I'd like you to follow all this because uh, I'm gradually gravitating towards uh, Asari versus Attorney General. You know, in 2010, when the Constitutional Review Commission was set up, there was a challenge to the power of the president to set up a Constitutional Review Commission. So I, I want us to follow all this so that uh, we can think through uh, that as well. I noticed that someone has raised up uh, his hand. Yeah, uh, you can talk. Uh, EJ, you can talk. Was it an accident? Uh, someone on the side, but let me see. I, I don't be muted. I'm not sure. Maybe the person uh, has picked up the hand without being aware.
Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that is the procedure for amending the intent provision. And if you look at uh, Article 291 of the Constitution, it also contains the procedure for amending uh, what you call the non uh, entrenched uh, provision. So, where you have the non entrenched provision, uh, the procedure is very uh, straightforward. We look at the article 291, uh, and uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward uh, over there. Uh, so, before a bill seeking to amend a non entrenched uh, provision of the constitution is introduced into parliament, according to article 291 of the constitution, it must be published twice in the Gazette, with the second publication being made at least three months after the first. And at least 10 days have passed after the second publication. So that is to say that uh, uh, you need to do two separate publication of the intention to, to amend the non entrenched provision uh, in the Gazette. And as you notice that Article 291 uh, plus one even provides timelines. Uh, and which should be observed in terms of uh, when to publish it in the Gazette and all that. And again, uh, after the speaker have uh, presided over the first reading of the bill in parliament, the speaker is supposed to make a referral to the Council of States. And the Council of States uh, has 30 days just like one we saw in the case of the uh, entrenched clause to advise the uh, parliament on the passage of the non entrenched uh, provisions of the constitution as uh, it were. So uh, where the council of state has, for example, begin its suggestions you know, that parliament will go ahead and then uh, approve the bill and uh, it will go through the usual procedure, the third reading, the second reading and all that. And it must obtain the votes of at least two thirds of all members of parliament. So two thirds of all members of parliament at the time. Uh, so if you have uh, 275 MPs, for example, then what it means is that uh, two thirds of that will have to approve whatever number of MPs that we have at that particular time, you must have at least two thirds of uh, that number. And let's pay attention. It did not say that members of parliament present, no, third of all the members. So in this particular case, what it means is that uh, the, the constitution is contemplating situation where every MP will be taking part in the proceeding. And out of that, to test must actually what? Agree that the amendment of the non entrenched provision should go uh, ahead uh, as it were. So uh, let us uh, keep that uh, in mind. You notice that in the case of Article 290, uh, when we're talking about amendment of the entrenched clause, it does not require uh, any uh, particular uh, majority of parliament to pass it because of the involvement of the referendum. So that where 75% of, uh, at least 40% of Ghanaians eligible to vote in the referendum have said, yes, it should be amended, then parliament will have to pass it. And in that case, yeah, sorry, the line went off, uh, I'm back again. Yeah, so I'm just making the point that uh, we should begin to appreciate the distinction uh, because 
in the case of the entrenched clause, the referendum is part of the uh, requirement. It is uh, important uh, for us to uh, note that uh, the constitution has not prescribed any particular Sorry for the break here and there. Yeah, so I'm just making the point that uh, in the case of the passage of the entrenched clause after the referendum, there's no particular parliamentary majority. So that being the case, uh, what it means is that a simple majority will, um, will just, I mean, even the parliamentary, you no, know, would, would just be a formality because uh, majority of Ghanaians are saying that let the amendment what, uh, uh, go on. So we do not foresee that MPs would like to stand in the way of the, 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 the generality of the, the voting public, knowing that referendum has been held and they have indicated overwhelmingly by 75% that the proposed uh, amendment should go ahead. Yeah, so let us uh, keep that uh, in mind. So. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, this is the uh, procedure for amending the constitution. But uh, another thing we should note is that where the amendment has actually satisfied the constitutional requirement, then uh, after 292 uh, of the constitution requires that uh, a bill for amendment of the constitution, which has been passed in accordance with the constitution, shall be assented to by the president only if certain requirements are required. First of all, there should be certificate from the speaker of parliament that the provision of the constitution will be complied with in relation to it. That is to say that uh, this bill, which has been passed amending the constitution fulfilled the requirements of the constitution itself. And for that matter, it is safe for the president to uh, assent to it. And there's another requirement uh, where you are dealing with entrenched provision. When you are dealing with entrenched provision, there must also be a certificate from the electoral commission uh, signed by the chairman of the commission and bearing the, the seal of the electoral commission saying that the bill was approved at referendum. So the president cannot assent to a bill seeking to an, uh, amend an entrenched provision where the bill is not accompanied by these two documents. Certificate of constitutional compliance by the Speaker of Parliament and also certificate by electoral commission that the bill has only been approved at the referendum. So that should be uh, kept uh, in mind. So, so basically, uh, this is uh, the, the, the procedure for amending the constitution as uh, captured in chapter 25. Now, it was against this uh, backdrop, those of you who remember uh, 2010, uh, when the then uh, president, I think President uh, Mills, uh, set up the uh, Constitutional Review Commission, and uh, he was really happened to be one of the lead uh, researchers for Ashanti region and the Eastern region, going around the various uh, uh, districts to try and elicit views of Ghanaians regarding uh, the proposed uh, amendments or which aspects of the constitution they wanted to be reformed and all that. So if you look at it, uh, around that time, uh, our uh, good friend, uh, Professor uh, Asari, uh, Professor Asari, of course, uh, whether you like him or you don't like him, uh, you cannot take away from Professor Asari that uh, he has been the black ban of uh, Ghana's constitutional law in contemporary times, in the sense of uh, he uh, taking the trouble to 
go to Supreme Court and seek interpretation whenever he feels strongly about anything as not being in harmony with the constitution. There are times that he's successful, times that he's not successful, but it still provides a useful opportunity for the Supreme Court to think through the constitutionality or otherwise of certain matters. So on that note, uh, we'd like to celebrate Professor Asari for uh, that job he's been doing for our country. Now, with respect to the constitutional uh, amendment and for that matter review, as I told you, uh, in 2010, the president uh, invoked uh, his powers, right? Invoke his powers with the respect to what they call commission of inquiry. He used that approach and then he set up a constitutional review uh, commission the idea was for the commission to actually engage uh, Ghanaians regarding what they thought about uh, the constitution, having operated it for uh, quite some time, as whether they thought that the constitution should be uh, changed or in, in one way or another. Yeah, so this was actually done by making use of Article 278. If you go to Article 278 of the Constitution, it gives the president the power to uh, set up commission of inquiry by passing constitutional instruments. So in pursuance of this uh, power to set up commission of inquiry, the president published CI-64, CI-64, setting up the Constitutional Review Commission. Now, this uh, CI, among other things, was challenged by Professor Stephen Kwekua Sari in the case between him and the Attorney General. Uh, and the case is uh, otherwise known as the Constitutional uh, Review uh, Commission uh, case. Now, in this case, uh, Professor Asare, as a plaintiff, uh, invoked the derogation of the Supreme Court under Article 21 and Article 130, Clause 1, uh, for a declaration that the Constitutional Review Commission and the Constitutional Review Implementation Commission, which was set up by the President of the Republic, uh, using his powers under uh, Article 278 of the Constitution. Uh, when he issued the Constitutional Instrument CI 64 to collect views of Ghana, Ghanaian people, and make recommendations for many of the Constitution, is unconstitutional and void. And again, uh, Professor Sare claimed that the amendment procedure, which we'll be discussing under Chapter 25 of the Constitution, was the exclusive preserve of parliament and could not be delegated and hence same could not be said by the president. In other words, uh, Asari was saying that the constitution itself has provided a mechanism for its amendment. And we've seen that not too long ago when we all discussed uh, chapter 25 of the constitution together, uh, starting from uh, article uh, 289 right up to Article 292, we've all seen it, the procedure or the mechanism for uh, amending uh, the constitution. So in Asari's view, the procedure in chapter 25 was a procedure which was actually uh, around parliament. Parliament, as part of its lawmaking function, was responsible for uh, using the mechanism under 25 to amend aspects of the constitution. And that could not be done by the president of the Republic. So the case uh, was heard by seven uh, justices of our Supreme Court. And the court in a majority of five to two uh, dismissed the claim of Professor Asari uh, 
the plaintiff that uh, parliament was the exclusive authority with the power to amend the constitution in accordance with chapter 25 of the constitution. And the court reasoned among others that that's part of the fact that parliament has power to amend the constitution pursuant to chapter 25. There was nothing express. There was nothing uh, clearly evident on the face of the said uh, chapter which barred or prevented the president from initiating uh, pre-legislative procedures uh, for draft bills we propose parliament for the, for the proposed the purpose of amending it. In other words, the court was saying that, yes, if you look at chapter 25, there's no doubt it provides procedure for amending entrenched and non-entrenched. That is true. A close reading of it, there is nothing there who shows that it is not permissible for the president to uh, engage in any exercise uh, which will serve as a prelude or to serve as a preliminary uh, uh, measure before we actually uh, make use of the specific procedures over there. So the court was saying that, yes, uh, the president by setting up the commission of inquiry in the form of the Constitutional Review Commission to engage Ghanaians have done nothing wrong. And what, yeah, what the president did uh, according to the court was uh, nothing wrong. And the court took the view that if you actually look at the powers of the president uh, with respect to Article 106, uh, Clause 14, Article 108, and Article 179 to initiate bills, for passage of laws in Ghana, the obvious implication was that uh, if the president could initiate bills for laws we pass, then the president could also uh, take steps for commission of inquiry, for example, to uh, solicit proposals, solicit views, which could culminate in the amendment of the constitution. And According to the court, uh, these were front end activities and there was nothing wrong and it was not uh, violative of the constitution. Yeah, so please uh, uh, look at uh, Asari versus uh, Attorney uh, General, uh, which was uh, decided in the 2010, around the time that the review commission uh, was set up. Yes, yeah, so um, what we have seen uh, so far is that we have uh, attempted to uh, look at the procedure, right? The processes for actually getting the constitution amended. If you look at the entrenched provision, you look at the non entrenched provision. And I've also looked at it against the backdrop of uh, the work of the Constitutional Review Commission, as well as the constitutional challenge, which was mounted against that work in the form of uh, 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 Asari against uh, Attorney General. Now, having done that, uh, what I would like to draw your attention to before uh, we finish uh, tonight or before I take uh, your questions and all that, is that now we need to be interested in specific areas which we think are candidates for reform, right? So for example, uh, the issue of the deputy speakers of parliament, whether when they are presiding, they have the right to vote or not the right to vote. Of course, the Supreme Court has actually uh, determined it, uh, notwithstanding uh, that, is there something that you think that, uh, assuming we're reforming the constitution, we need to reform it. And as I've told you, a very useful material, right, is for us to go to the report of the Constitution Review Commission and the white paper, which the government at the time also issued. Once you read uh, those two documents, you notice that 
we get a lot of ideas. Even those matters which have become controversial and have made their way into Supreme Court, uh, we can get aspects of them reflected in the Constitutional Review Commission. So that can actually guide our thinking as we prepare in anticipation of uh, a question which may invite us to uh, probably uh, discuss anything in relation to either amendment of the constitution or uh, review of the constitution. And I'm particularly uh, interested in those type of questions because of the fact that uh, the constitution is uh, you know, practically uh, 30 years old. And if I'm an examiner uh, asking questions, I would like to take, I would like uh, students to do some kind of like their thinking uh, as far as uh, some of these matters are concerned. And of course, uh, another thing I would like us to also think through uh, uh, maybe I don't have to, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in another class. Uh, let, me, let me leave that here. I wanted to draw your attention to something in relation to Article 33, Cross 5 of the Constitution, and then the LGBT against the backdrop of the, the DOPS uh, Secretary of State against the uh, Mississippi decision by the US Supreme Court, especially. Uh, when the U U.S. Supreme Court seems to be saying that uh, there are certain matters which should not be resolved by the court, it should be resolved by the people. So issue of abortion, for example, of course, that's not the problem here, but over there, that the people should actually decide. So if they go to a referendum and decide uh, whether it should be this way or that way, that should be it, and it should not be the preserve of the court to try and impose its uh, policy choices on the people. So can we, for example, uh, draw a similar lesson in relation to uh, this uh, LGBTI, same-sex marriage and things like that? I mean, these are just matters I am thinking aloud about them. It doesn't mean that there's anything uh, concrete in that uh, respect. So at this stage, I would like to pause and then uh, still about constitutional law, I'd like to take some of your concerns or problem areas so that it will inform our subsequent uh, lessons if we are doing constitutional law. So I'll pause and take your thoughts, okay? But let one person speak at a time. Uh, Prof Professor Sarri's case, okay, I'll try and uh, download it and then uh, send it to you. Uh, who else? I think you can unmute yourself. Or, yeah, you can unmute yourself. Uh, or you don't, do you have any particular U.S. in constitutional law, which you think that you would need us to have one or two lessons on, just let me know. I know some of you will be learning this over and over again that you've even become uh, experts. So you may not need any particular. Uh, okay, somebody is asking for the CRS report. Okay, I'll put them on the platform for you, those who are there. But uh, before I leave you, and before uh, because nobody is talking, let me uh, share this thought with you. Uh, some of you, especially those who will be writing these uh, exams more than one uh, occasion and all that, I will advise you to make effort to try and uh, practice more 
you know, writing of answers to question. In other words, pay attention to uh, how you solve problem. And when you have written, read what you have written. Because uh, if the examiner's board are to allow the scripts you know, to be shown to you, you will agree that some people should actually fail. Okay. So for, 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 for a good number of you, your problem is not so much about probably uh, you not uh, having the knowledge in terms of like the substantive topics and all that, but the way and manner you write your answers, how you write uh, you know, your responses to the question, that is the problem. Okay, uh, I'll pause here. Alejandro, your hand is up. Yes, let's hear you. Uh, uh, okay, uh, good evening, Doc. Uh, uh, please, oh, I, I want cl clarity on this because this, this thing is not a problem for me alone. It's, it's something that's a problem for some of my other colleagues as well, because sometimes in the exam, so when you are answering questions and it demands you to add cases, sometimes you tend to forget the cases, but you seem to have an idea. I mean, how, how well can we balance that in answering questions? That's a challenge. All right, okay, Alejandro, thank yeah, you very do. much for we, the question. We can do with that. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, uh, Alejandro, for the question. Uh, now, first of all, when marking schemes are done, okay, especially for questions relating to the typical common law subjects, Let's say you have a contract, a question in relation to contract or thought, you know, contract or thought, you probably, uh, you know, sometimes maybe like land law, of course, constitutional and all that. If you produce your answer and there is no case law, assuming the question involves a topic which has got so many cases that uh, is problematic because what it means is that it's going to let the examiner get a very negative view about you as uh, not having studied your LLB well so that is the first uh, comment but there's also the practical challenge that you've actually forgotten the name of the cases. So what do you do? Now, in terms of title of cases, we have like the full title, and then we have, there's a part of the, for example, if you say a service case, right? And then a service case into bracket, constitutional review commission case. Uh, everybody knows uh, what you're talking about. Or those times where you don't even remember the title of the case at all, but you remember what happened in the case, remember the court who decided the case. You know that this particular case is a Supreme Court uh, case. So you tell us uh, what happened in that case and then where the Supreme Court held that. So, so now the, the person reading your answer will know that uh, this student has forgotten the title of the case but he or she certainly knows about the case. Because if he or she does not know about the case, uh, he cannot tell us uh, you know, these particular details regarding what happened in the case and what the court held. So Alejandro, insofar as you have learned the cases and you know them, should it even happen that you don't remember the title of the case. You should be able to give evidence to let 
your readers become convinced that you've learned uh, those cases, but you've forgotten the name. Yeah, so that one, I don't think it should be so much of a problem. But where it's not just a name you've forgotten, you just don't know anything about it, then that one is different. You, you, you just don't know, so that one is different, okay? All right, any other? Okay, then uh, in absence of this, maybe my advice to you is that uh, every, uh, okay, somebody has said you should look at constitutionalism. All right, you, you add it to the topic. My advice is that uh, every evening, maybe around 9.30, I just use the same link uh, and come online, see if I'm online, then you join. Okay, so have 